Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It seems that analog technologies are more reliable than, than telecom these days. Um, so we can go home. I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here and, and to join you to celebrate MCS 20th anniversary. Congratulations, Jessman and all, all colleagues. Topic of my talk today is digital transformation. And I really have two, two messages. Yeah? The first one is that digital transformation is not just something for big tech companies or for technophile societies like South Korea. It's really, the challenge is really about improving everyday lives for, for all citizens. And the second message is that people working in the telecom sector like us, we attend lots of seminars, conferences, presentation on the latest technologies. You know, one day we go to a seminar on cloud, the following day on AI, on 5G. And the truth is, none of these great invention alone is any way likely to change really the scene. What will create better societies for citizens is the creation of ecosystems. And this is actually much more complicated than rolling out 5G, which itself is already a challenge, as, uh, as we know. And what I'd like to do with you is, uh, is give you a few examples of the benefits, to give us a bit of courage to raise to the challenge, and then we'll talk about, we'll talk about the challenges. I told you digitization of society is about improving everyday life. Let's take healthcare. You know, sadly in Europe, and actually the same in China, the US, in our rich societies, we face an aging population, you know. At the same time, the World Health Organization believes that by the end of this decade, so coming up very quickly, there will be a shortage of 18 million medical staff. 18 million. Can you imagine? So, in connection with digitization of society, one obvious possible response, of course, is to have more care delivered at home rather than in hospitals. But that implies, of course, continuous health care link between the home and hospital. It includes uh, the use of sensors in, in the form of bracelets and other things to monitor uh, uh, the health condition of the patient. It means that doctors no longer wait for the patient to call the ambulance, but they use predictive analytics to act preventively before, before something, something occurs. And no misunderstanding, send, and, and by the way, it's not about sending the, these poor doctors uh, more data, they're already very busy. What they need is information on the point of action. And I'm not at all suggesting that we are going to replace you know, nurses by robots. Huh? It's about basically augmenting the capacity of, of the staff that we have and making them, making them more, more efficient. Uh, exos exoskeleton is another field, but we, we don't have time to, to discuss that. Another field, rather surprisingly, where IoT and 5G and so on will make a huge difference is farming. You know? uh, uh, whether it's in the field of cattle, I won't have time to discuss that, but for example, back home in Belgium, and I'm sure it's true in many other European countries, we are experimenting with drones, 5G, IoT, to reduce massively the amount of pesticides that are used in agriculture, which is good for the environment, it's also good for the finance of, of our farmers. Uh, traffic congestions, I mean, uh, Malta, Mal I mean, Brussels is a very multi-city. When I, when I drove this morning, both the weather and the traffic condition are very similar to Brussels. <laughs> And, and, and clearly, one of the challenges that uh, all our countries are facing is how do you convince, how do you convince drivers to not to, not to perhaps give up completely their cars, but certainly to, use their, to not use their car each time they need to buy a bread. Huh? And, and, and uh, I know that in, in Malta, you've got a number of uh, great companies, school, uh, uh, go-to, and, and so voila, the solution, technical solutions are there. The question is, what are the incentives that we will put in place to convince you know, our citizens, our companies to, to make the switch? Another field very close to my heart is education. 
and uh, Fabiana and, and uh, can, can perhaps uh, uh, come back on that later. Education. Today, education, we all learn in a different way, whether it's by some of us, you know, lucky one, they learn by just reading, others uh, learn by listening, others learn the hard way by having to write, you know. And still, when you look at our education, they are still very much monolithical, you know. We, we teach all our students in the, in the same way. Well, actually, what we really need now is to personalize education and to go, it's not about replacing teachers by, by robots and videos, it's about blended learning. It's about customization to really customize and, and be able to interact with, with students uh, you know, in, in a very specific way. And by the way, it's not just true for students. I mean, too many of our companies are still limiting permanent education to sending their stuff two or three days per year to a seminar. This is... This is uh, I don't want to paint a, a rosy picture. You know, I told you all the great things that digitization could achieve. I gave you a few examples at least. Uh, the, the thing is, the beauty of digitization, it will definitely help us solve problems that we face in the physical work, world. At the same time, it will make some problems worse. You know? And this is the exact problem on the non-physical uh, side. I'll give you a few examples. And uh, if we want to succeed in this digital transformation, we really, need, we really need to focus on two things, is show to our workers, our students, our citizens, what, what's in it for them, why would they benefit from this transformation, and two, we've got to address their fears, and this is what I will try to, to explain now. Let's say I'm a very good mathematics teacher, you know, and I just heard Philip saying that digitization of education is the future. And I have just been sitting through the pandemics trying to teach my students, you know, over Zoom and so on, and I have seen the level of education <laughs> of the marks I give at the exam go down dramatically, you know. So what's in it for me, you know? So what's in it for me? We need to explain to uh, this teacher what's important. I'm a doctor, you know, I'm a very good doctor. I also have to feed my family. Huh? I need to make money. Today, I get my remuneration for every medical act that I perform. Philippe tells me that in the future, I will be able to, mon to monitor my patient, you know, via IoT and 5G, and I will get an alert whenever how do, I, how do I make my, you see, so what's in it for me? So we need to, uh, I, I work for a large corporation, you know, which is the case perhaps for a number of, of people in this room. And I'm told there is a massive program of digital transformation. And I may be a bit nervous. I may wonder what's going to happen to my job. If I'm part of a continuous education system where I'm acquiring new skills, then it's more likely that I will embrace this digitization. Now, uh, that's very important to show people what's in it for them and why they will benefit from this transformation. Alleviating the fears. I'm a farmer. I, I'm, I can vaguely understand that digital transformation will boost productivity in farming. But I was told that already 30, 40 years ago during the Green Revolution. And I was convinced to buy Monsanto seeds and, and Monsanto pesticides. And after, after a few years, I was economically completely dependent on these multinational companies. How can we guarantee to this farmer that John Deere will not own all this data and exploit it in the same way that Monsanto did? But alleviating the fear. Of, of citizens and so on. So it's all about building trust. It's, uh, uh, I don't, the list of tasks that regulators, legislators uh, uh, have to perform to build this trust in, in the digital economy is endless. There is the connectivity, which telecom people in this room know, know very well, security, privacy. Uh, fair taxation, we will see what OECD delivers. But I'll, I'll give you uh, uh, three examples where I think, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop uh, just now. I'll give you three examples of the kind of actions where 
regulators, legislators should, should really act. The first one that is very dear to my heart is this business of data sharing and reuse. You know, we, we, we live in a, in a society increasingly that is fueled by data. And if you want to, to develop a vibrant economy for the 21st century, uh, you need good computers, you need data scientists, that's already more difficult, <laughs> and you need good data sets. So how, how can we develop public policies to avoid data hoarding? How can we avoid having our companies sitting on data sets and how can we convince them to basically, through trusted third parties and other contractual arrangements, how can we convince them to share these data uh, in the respect of privacy, of course, with, with others. I'll give you another example. Ethical use for the use of AI. Asian citizens are very technophile. You know, Asians, there is a new technology. They don't even know what it is. They know they want it. You know? In Europe, we rather lead, lean on the opposite side. Our societies in Europe are, uh, I'm not saying they're technophobic, but they lean a bit more on, the, on that side. So if we want our citizens to embrace AI, we need really to develop strong sectoral ethical rules for the use of AI and avoid, uh, otherwise we will face a backlash, you could call it a tech lash, and it will bring us back 10 years and it, it's going to be, to be really hard to impose this on, a, on society. So we need strong rules and we need a lot of uh, evangelization, if you like. The role of regulators is not just to set rules, it's also, I think, increasingly a role of evangelist where they have to explain the benefits of the digital economy to society. And I'll, I'll finish with a, a final example uh, to show that uh, the challenges on the legal regulatory front are really, are really huge. Is, uh, uh, let, let's take the example of uh, self-driving cars, you know, which is, you know, in, in the traffic congestion, it'd be great to be, to be reading our newspaper rather than be behind the steering wheel. If you are going to convince drivers to use self-driving cars, uh, you, we need to address the question of product liability. You know, if there is a car crash, who is liable? Is it the insurance company, the car manufacturers, the drivers, the company providing the software to the car manufacturer? So this, this, this is just another example of a uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but I could have really spent all my speaking time merely listing the initiative that regulators, legislators have to take to turn digital uh, transformation into, into something concrete and bring benefits to, to all citizens and, and companies. Thank you very much, and again, happy anniversary to MC.